Welcome back to our series on rose and perfumery and this video is going to be the final video in the series. So in this video we're going to go and take the rose base that we made in the last video and also one of the professional rose bases and we're going to go and blend that firstly with some other raw materials to see how they combine and then at the end of the video we're going to go and blend them with some pre-made perfume structures. So essentially seeing the effect of the rose itself on the perfume and how it changes it. So if you're interested in that Stay tuned and you'll find out in this video. Now, just a quick reminder before we begin, if you haven't already seen the other videos in the series, then be sure to go to my channel and check those out or the link in the description below. That way you'll see the evaluation that I already made on the rose base we're gonna use from Fiminish and the rose base that we made. And you can also see the whole uh, construction process for that formula of the custom rose base. And then that will leave you with the kind of background that you might find interesting in order to watch this video. So let's get into it. So what I decided to do is take the Feminish Rose Essence and that is because that was the closest to the real rose oil but I didn't actually want to use up too much of my actual rose oil because I've only got a very tiny tiny amount of it. So that was kind of the benchmark for a realistic rose without actually using real rose. Then I took the RO6A base from the last video, so that was kind of my preferred trial version of the rose base, which we went and made. And then what I decided to do was go and do what I call binary combinations, which is essentially taking one raw material and mixing it with another raw material at some kind of ratio. Uh, it doesn't really matter. For these uh, blends, I chose to use quite simple ratios, which you will see in a second when I go and do it. So what I decided to do was go and take five raw materials that I thought might blend well with the rose. So the five raw materials that I chose for my binary combinations were firstly ambroxan, which is often used in amber notes, but it's also pretty good for adding projection. Secondly, bergamot, one of the most common top notes, or top to mid notes, you could say. Then ethylene brassolate, which is one of the most common musks. And then finally, I tried raspberry ketone, and that was more just because this material I have trouble with, so I thought it would maybe be interesting to see if anything happens uh, when I smell it with the rose. And finally, I chose vanillin because, again, this is a really common base note, and it's often used in perfumes to make them sweeter. It can be used in amber notes, a lot of other things, and I just thought it'd be interesting to see specifically uh, the effects of vanillin and rose together and what happens. So what I did was I took these five raw materials at either a 10% or a 1% dilution, kind of depending a bit on how I felt, but also just a bit on how strong they were. And then I went to do a 50-50 blend with either the rose essence base or the RO6A base, which we made in the other video. So the two rose bases, and those were also at 10% dilution. So essentially we were doing a 50-50 or a one-to-one -one mix of either 10% uh, raw material to 10% rose base, or 1% stronger raw material to 10% rose base. Now, you may be thinking, hang on a minute, the RO6A base which we made in the last video, that didn't end up at 10%, it ended up at 6.06%. Um, I'm sure a couple of you would have noticed that. So what I actually had to go and do is scale this base up to more of a standard 10% dilution. So I'm going to go and show you right now how I did that scaling in formula and then after that we're going to go jump back in and look at how all of these different blends actually smelled. Okay so what we want to do is we want to take our rose accord and we want to make it usable as if it were another raw material in order to go and blend it later on into our perfume compositions. So what I want to do is take this rose accord formula and turn it into a base. So in a sense, it's already a base because it's a precise formula for an accord. But what I want to do is I want to go and scale it up to 10% because that's the dilution at which the other raw materials which I'm using are at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our rose accord formula and I'm going to duplicate it and I'm going to make a 10% scaled version of that formula. Now this, by the way, is going to be the workflow that I'm using to do the scaling in formula. But if you don't have formula, uh, feel free to go and scale your own accord a different way if you wish. You could do all the maths manually, or you could use an Excel spreadsheet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this formula 
and I'm going to see if I can scale it to 10%. Now at the moment I can only scale it up to 7.43 and that's because in order to scale a formula to a high percentage you need to remove perfumes alcohol but at the moment I don't have very much perfumes alcohol in the formula. So what I can do is in order to get it up to 10% I can start uh, switching out some of these 10% dilutions for something a bit more concentrated in order to free up some of the perfume as alcohol used in those dilutions. Before I do that, however, I'm actually going to go and scale the whole thing up to 5 grams just to make a bit more of it because that's how much I'm going to make anyway at the end of the whole thing. 5 grams, that's uh, probably about two thirds full for a sample vial, a 10 ml sample vial that I have. So I'm going to go and do that. And all that's going to do is because we're using larger amounts, it's just going to mean that any scaling I do is going to be a bit more accurate, or the maths of it is going to be a bit more accurate. So next what I want to do is I want to, in order to maintain the accuracy when I'm scaling, I want to switch out the, um, the formula entries with the highest mass in grams in order to scale them out to a more pure version, because when I split them, what I'm going to be doing is splitting the pure raw material from the perfumes alcohol in that 10% dilution or 1% dilution. Um, that splitting is going to work best if I use raw materials that already use a large amount. Otherwise, after the splitting, I'm going to be left with a small amount. So that sounds quite abstract, but it might make sense when I actually go and do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to sort by um, the weight in order to find the raw materials with the most weight. And I can already see that phenyl ethyl alcohol here is the one with the largest weight. So that's what I'm going to try first. So I'm going to take the phenyl ethyl alcohol and I'm going to split that up. So you see how it's 10% as a dilution. I want to split it into uh, 0.1 grams of phenyl ethyl alcohol and the other 0.9 grams in there, which is perfumes alcohol. I just want to add that into the uh, kind of pool of perfumes alcohol in the formula. So I'm just going to go and scale that. And I'm going to do in formula, you can do it by exchange solvent, and then just select 100% because we're going from 10% to 100%. And what that option does is it puts that remainder of the alcohol into the perfume as alcohol. So now I'm going to go again on the total, try scaling it and see if I can bring it up to 10%. So not quite, we're almost there. It's at 9.56, but I still need to create a bit more perfume as alcohol that's free in the formula. So I'm now going to go and look for something else to scale up. So in this case, I'm actually going to choose the rose oxide. And that's just because it's going to be quite easy going from 1% to 10%. In general, I prefer weighing out the 10% dilutions than uh, the pure um, raw materials, just because um, it can be a bit harder to actually go and weigh those out accurately because the drop sizes really vary quite a lot. So I'm going to go into the rose oxide and I'm going to scale that up. Again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale it from 1% to 10% and I'm going to take all of the solvent that would have been um, essentially creating that 1% dilution from the 10% and I'm going to return it into our pool of solvent. So again, I'm going to go and exchange solvent and then I'm going to go from 1% up to 10% this time. And then what we've done is we've changed our rose oxide to 10%. So now we've got a smaller amount of it, but we've gone and uh, exchanged that excess solvent in there into the perfumes alcohol. Now this should be enough to go and scale it up to 10%, and it is. So I can now scale up to 11%. We only wanted to scale up to 10. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type in 10%, and I'm gonna scale now the whole formula to 10%. So now looking at this, I've got the whole formula written as 10%. So we've essentially made the whole formula stronger. And this now, I'm going to add it as a raw material. So essentially, this is going to be RO6A. I'm going to use this as a base. So I'm going to say rose base RO6A. So that's just so I remember that it's from that. Um, that formula, if I ever want to go out and actually check what it is. And I'll categorize it as rose, I think, for now. And I'll make sure to add that 10% dilution. So this 
10% dilution here now is going to be, um, well, if I go and make up the formula that I've just gone and made here, because its total concentration is 10%, if I want to then go and use this base inside a formula, I can simply add this raw material as a single entry and then use a 10% dilution. And then I know if I ever need to go and make some more of that 10% dilution, all I need to do is go and make up this exact formula that I've got stored here. And then we can use that just like a raw material in the perfume. So what I'm going to go and now do is I'm actually going to go and make up this um, this formula, this 10% dilution of our RO6A base. And then after we've done that, we can actually go and start blending it into the perfume formulas. Okay, so now to go and smell through our matrix of blends that we've gone and made. So conveniently, I've gone and made them already over here. And now I'm going to go through them and let you guys know what they smell like. So we're going to start off with the Ambroxan or the Ambrofix on its own. Um, it's got quite a unique smell. I find it hard to describe, but it's also very distinctive in my mind. Like when you smell that smell, you'll for sure recognize it. So it's very diffusive, firstly, when you put it on the scent strip. So you can smell it from quite a distance away. And to me, it smells kind of like this uh, golden, marine, um, kind of airy smell. Um, it's also got this kind of slightly dirty side to it, and it does have this kind of ambery quality. So it's no surprise this is often used in things like amber cores, but really uh, they put this in just about every perfume. And it's also naturally found in ambergris, which is probably a topic for another day. So. When you take this Ambroxan and you go mix it with the rose bases, what does it do to them? So for me, the interesting thing about this blend is when you do this mixture, because I use 1% Ambroxan, it ends up at 0.5% in the final formula, which I would say is a reasonable strength for Ambroxan because it's a very strong thing. So you could actually say that's pretty strong. Um, but of course, the rose is quite strong as well. And when you put the two together, I really find that it kind of adds this like dirty side to the rose. Because normally when I smell Ambroxan, especially when it's far away or it's at a low dilution, it's quite pleasant and diffusive. And it's not that this isn't pleasant, but I would say it adds um, definitely kind of like an animalic side to the rose or that side of the Ambroxan, which I wouldn't say is emphasized on its own, seems to come out more. Next then we have the Bergamot. So on its own, uh, Bergamot is this kind of, um, I would say it's quite a kind of bright, uh, kind of citrusy smell. It's a bit like Earl Grey tea, or very much like Earl Grey tea, because that's what they put in it. And it's kind of um, a little bit sharp, a little bit tangy. Um, it's not citrus in the same way that an orange is kind of very uh, almost sweet and bright, but it's, um, it's a similar kind of smell, roughly. And if you've smelled linalol before, you'll know that uh, bergamot is a lot closer to the smell of linalol, and that's also because it's got a lot inside. So that's what bergamot smells like on its own. Now, when you go and blend it with the rose. So these two together, um, I quite like them. I think they work quite well. It's not as though they create some kind of crazy new smell or anything, um, but it seems like they just fit well together. Um, the rose kind of acts as this heart note that's a bit softer, a bit sweeter. Um, quite large in terms of the space that it fills um, but it forms like a really good kind of backdrop that the bergamot blends into it's got this it really brings out that kind of fizzy citrusy side to the bergamot and i think the rose actually rounds out the bergamot it kind of softens it a little bit but it still allows it to kind of shine through so i would say that these two things actually work really well together next we have the ethylene bracelet so on its own, ethylene brassolate is a musk, um, which often may be a little bit harder for beginners to smell. So if you're having trouble with this one, um, don't worry, keep trying and you'll get there eventually. But on its own, it's just quite, um, it's very subtle. Um, it's, you know, it, it's toned down and it's got this kind of musky kind of like, I don't know, maybe slightly lacquer like, um, maybe kind of like very dry icing sugar. Something very uh, discreet, that kind of smell, but it, you know, it lasts a long time. Um, and then when you go blend it with a rose, I wouldn't uh, say that they make any kind of accord in particular. So it's not like they, uh, 
they don't meld together maybe as much as the bergamot and the rose did. But what it feels like is they, they just fit quite well together, a bit like uh, the pieces in a jigsaw. So you've got this kind of big musky base for your perfume that's kind of the, you know, the foundation or the dry down, whatever you want to say. And it feels like the rose just kind of sits on top of that very naturally and they, they really blend together seamlessly. You don't notice um, the two things being completely separate. It's like they fade into one another. And I think that's quite nice. And I guess what you can learn from that is you can just kind of use a uh, rose and ethylene brassolate quite reliably well together as this kind of solid uh, core, kind of mid to base uh, part of your perfume. Now, I'm just going to pause for a second and mention the fact that I haven't really uh, noted too much the differences between the rose base that I made and the Feminish one. So, of course, these rose bases do smell quite different and that carries over into those blends. Namely, uh, my one is a little bit more kind of maybe a bit sweeter um, and a little bit softer. Um, it's got a bit more of kind of the um, that kind of tang from the geranol formate. You can just about notice that as well. And then the, the Ferminish rose base, I would say, probably smells a lot more natural. And it also has got a lot more of those kind of spicy nuances, which is something that I didn't really want to include too much in my rose base. Um, so you can definitely tell that those differences are there in these blends. But in general, so far with these, there hasn't been too much of a difference on what this extra raw material is actually doing to the rose base, which is why I haven't really mentioned the difference between them. So... Next, we're going to move on to the Raspberry Ketone. Now, this one I don't have a whole lot to say about, and the problem with that is, or the reason for that, is because uh, Raspberry Ketone is just something that I actually have a lot of trouble smelling, uh, even to this day. And when I go and smell it, I do feel like I smell something on the scent strip, but it's just very, very subtle, it's quite faint, and it's, um, I guess, it reminds me just slightly of vanilla, maybe with this slight fruity side to it, almost a little bit like a musk. But I'm not sure if it's just that my nose is not too good at picking up this particular molecule, which is something that can happen, or I just am not very good at detecting it yet, which could also be the case because I don't smell it that often. Um, it might be a mixture of the two. So on its own, it smells of this kind of very subtle, um, kind of slightly vanilla, musky thing and it's quite fleeting as well and I think that maybe whatever it is is a bit like iron in a sense that it's causing olfactory fatigue quickly um, and that would mean that you smell it and then not too long after you can't smell it anymore so that may be also causing me some trouble but when I go and mix these rose bases with the raspberry ketone I thought that maybe adding the raspberry ketone to a blend instead of just on its own might help me smell it a bit more but honestly I don't really notice too much of an effect on the on the rose bases. I feel like maybe they added a slight sweetness to it, um, but it's not enough for me to be 100% sure. So for now, I'm just going to say that I'm probably not too good uh, with the raspberry ketone at this stage. So, so finally we've got the vanillin, and the vanillin was one that I actually thought worked quite well with the rose. So on its own, Vanilla smells, well, it smells a lot like vanilla, which it's named after, and yeah, it's this kind of sweet, creamy vanilla kind of smell. And when you put it with the rose, I found it was quite interesting, because especially this is one where maybe the, the two different um, rose bases had a bit more of an effect, but both of them, what they did was they made it going from smelling more like a rose on a flower to more of a rose kind of flavoring or a rose that you'd find in food, which makes a lot of sense because vanilla is used all the time in uh, sweet foods. But what it reminded me more was something like Turkish Delight or specifically, I would say rose syrup or rose liqueur. Definitely adding the vanilla in made it more like that to me. So I do really like that. I think it smells really, really nice. It smells kind of really yummy, like something you want to eat. Um, but I guess you gotta be careful in a perfume that depends kind of on how you want your perfume to smell. If you're doing a gourmand perfume and you want it to smell like food or something, then it'd be perfect. But if you're, say, doing a bright, fresh green rose, then maybe you want to avoid the vanilla because it's just going to make it thick and sweet and kind of ruin uh, that kind of atmosphere of the perfume. So I would say that the rose essence, which is a feminish base, 
it had like a really nice kind of, it just had a really nice smell when you blend it with the rose. So it kind of made it like this, I don't know, rose syrup or something like that. And it just made me want to keep smelling it. My base, when you blend that with the rose, not quite as nice to the same degree. And definitely smells a little bit more synthetic. But it still had a similar kind of effect in that it was a nice combination. I definitely like the two together. Okay, so that's the end of the binary combinations. Now, of course, you could keep going forever and just do that with all the raw materials if you wanted to. One thing I would recommend is if you're thinking about making a perfume with rose and then, say, adding a raw material, then you might want to kind of do a simple experiment beforehand just to kind of work out on its own what things would go well with it before you go and create the whole confusion of a perfume where you've got all these different raw materials. It can kind of help you isolate which things are working together and which things aren't. Um, but if you're interested in these, then I would go and recommend that you do some of these yourself. So take rose or whatever raw material really, and just blend it with something else. Anyway, now for the final part, which is putting the rose in a perfume, we're essentially doing the same thing, but instead of a single raw material, we're actually going to use a pre-made perfume base. And then we're going to go and do that same experiment where we do like a 50-50 mix. So the rose base at 10% and the perfume base at 10%. And we're just going to go and see the effect of that on the perfume base. So the idea here is, hey, I've got a perfume. What would happen if I were to add rose? And the idea is if you did that on enough perfume structures, then eventually you kind of get a good idea for the effect of rose on a perfume. So what I've got here is the Fougère base, which we made in the Fougère uh, video. So the Fougère record video, which was probably a few months back. And on its own, the Fougère base that I made, it's quite, um, I would say it's leaning more to the herbal or the kind of quite rustic side of a Fougère, which is what I wanted to leave it at. It's got slight uh, nuances of things like coconut in here even. And I came back to this and I actually thought I still quite like this accord, which is a good sign. So the question is what happens when you add the rose? So when I was doing the video with the Fougère, I remember that we actually tried adding rose back then and I didn't like it, which is why we didn't continue with it in the basic accord, even though a lot of fougères do have rose. Now, revisiting it, I think what's going on here is on a more objective level, what the rose is doing is it's kind of adding this kind of subtle sweetness and this kind of, um, this, you know, it's got a, it adds kind of a volume and a sweetness to the fougère accord. But what it also does in the context of the fougère is it makes it smell closer to a standard kind of fougère, which would have traditionally been used in a lot of household products, things like soaps. And I think it's because of that association that personally on a subjective level, I'm not a big fan of having the rose in the fougère because it really softens it out. It takes away its kind of unique character and it just, for me, turns it into a generic kind of old fashioned perfume smell. But I think it's interesting to note that when you kind of really smell what's happening, it's kind of adding this kind of transparent, but I would say um, this large kind of diffusive sweetness, but in a subtle way, it's not sweet in the same way as something like vanilla or ethyl maltol, when it's kind of like a sugary sweet. This is much more um, subtle. It's kind of like a, a, a floral sweetness or... A, a kind of, it's almost like a, a sweetness without the sugar, if that was a possible thing. It's like a very kind of, it's much, it's much more dry and, and kind of, um, it just adds this kind of gummy quality, let's say. It's like a gummy quality without being um, sugary sweet. So that was the Fougère. The other one we're going to look at is the Grosjean Accord, which I also made a few videos back. And again, that is a frequently used perfume structure. So for the Grosjean Accord on its own, uh, what it smells like is it's kind of this thick kind of layers of musk and it's got this violet aspect from the iron and they all kind of blend well together to make this quite powerful kind of just uh, kind of huggable, they call it the hug me accord perfume smell. So when you add the rose, uh, I found it really interesting because similarly to the Fougère, what it did was it added that same kind of um, wide open you could call it sweetness or gumminess in that kind of, I would say it's kind of a slightly fruity 
Um, it's kind of a bit floral, um, but it's quite kind of nondescript in between. But especially when I added the rose essence, the feminish base, which is kind of the, the better quality rose base, you could say, to the Groschman Accord, I found it really, really nice. Like, they worked really, really well together. And what it did was it took the kind of purple violetness from the Iron Own for me, and it kind of changed that color into more of a fruity red. So it kind of, it was almost like mixing colors, and it was taking that kind of classic purple, and it was like making it into this kind of big kind of, um, I don't know, it was just like a, a really nice kind of fruity, kind of translucent red color, in my mind at least. And it was like, it was a really nice kind of addition, and it just helped kind of change the overall smell of the Accord, in a sense. It was kind of like turning a knob on an amplifier or a speaker. It was kind of like changing the tone of it without actually changing the overall character of that perfume base. Then again, my Accord, it did a similar thing to some degree, though I would say it wasn't quite as nice. Um, my version left it smelling a bit more soapy for some reason, which I found interesting. So it must be that uh, something maybe I've put in my chord at to a higher level, or actually those kind of spicy notes that were in the rosescence or whatever else they put in there could actually be really important for um, the overall rose smell when you're going to blend it. But overall, what I found here was, yeah, the Grosjean Accord works really, really nicely with the rose. And you can always think of adding rose to the Grosjean Accord of like turning this tone dial on the Accord and you're kind of deciding, do I want it more of like a powdery violet direction or more of a kind of gummy, sweet, uh, slightly fruity, slightly floral, kind of more of a rouge direction. And depending on how much rose you add, it's how kind of far across you go on that scale, which I thought was quite nice. So, and with that, that is the end of the rose series. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this extended series. I've never really done something with such a large scope before with so many videos all for one topic. I'm sure some of you guys will be thankful that it's finally over so you can finally see some different videos from me about different topics. Um, and that will be happening from next week onwards. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this rose series, uh, regardless of if you like the smell of roses or not. I hope you at least learned something about the process of learning raw materials, using those raw materials to make accords, and finally working out how you can use those raw materials inside your perfumes. So that's it from me. If you enjoyed this video or the series as a whole, please consider giving the video a like or subscribing to the channel. Anything like that uh, really supports me. Also, do check out the formula formulation software that I used in this video to scale the rose base. Um, that is something which you can get online on the App Store. You can actually download it for free to try it out. So check that out too. There is a link in the description. And that's it from me. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time with another video on perfumery.